Welcome back to the Deep Discog Dive. You know, life's too short to be happy, so I decided to sell all of my videos to the one institution that puts art above all, venture capital. What did you bastards do to my baby? Look at this nonsense. I'm Michael D. Snare, and today we're counting down the top 10 worst musical artists of all time. Number one is Crazy Frog. These people have no respect for my work. I know I said life's too short to be happy, but it's even shorter to be outright slandering like this. Well, aside from lawsuits and diss tracks, there's only really one option left. Re-record it all. And I know exactly where to start. Today, we're talking about Taylor Swift. Let's dive in. Taylor Swift was born in Pennsylvania in 1989. Writing that down, that year might be important later. She was named after James Taylor, the James is silent. Her interest in music came from a mixture of Disney movies, musical theater, and her family since her grandmother was an opera singer. It wasn't until her discovery of Shania Twain and Faith Hill that she decided to become a country singer. With emotional and financial support from her family, she started taking trips out to Nashville to play shows and submit demos to record labels. And following her signing to RCA, her family officially moved to Nashville when she was just 14. Said signing to RCA ended soon after the move, but it did give her the chance to network with many of Nashville's heavy hitters. One night, she met Scott Borchetta, who was just about to start his own label, Big Machine Records. The two hit it off with Swift signing as one of the label's first acts, and after bringing on her demo producer, Nathan Chapman, Swift got to work on her first album. And ever since that album, Taylor Swift has gone on to see a career full of success, awards, and discourse. Some from yours truly. In fact, if you're a longtime viewer of the DDD, a thought might be bubbling in the back of your mind. Mike, didn't you cover Taylor Swift already? Well, here's the thing. I covered Taylor Swift back when the Deep Discog Dive was a much different kind of series, one that was more about rapid fire hot takes. The DDD of present is a series that I think is more thoughtful, comprehensive, and better. And looking back, the old Taylor Swift dive just felt very dismissive and not really emblematic of the spirit that I tried to embody in these videos. So following in her lead, I'm redoing her dive. I will say though, please don't expect revisits like this to become a very regular thing. Part of the joy in doing this series for me is getting to learn the story of an artist and that feeling diminishes when I'm going back to do someone I've already covered. So with all that in mind. Taylor Swift, both the artist and album, made their debuts in October 2006. And more than anything else, Taylor Swift, the album, showcases one of Taylor Swift, the artist's greatest strengths, specificity. Take one of the big singles, Our Song. On the surface, it's just a song about the little nice things in a relationship, but it's the details presented that matter. Slamming screen doors, a bed of roses with a note left by your boyfriend, talking quietly so your mom doesn't hear. Sure, I might not relate to the specifics in a song like Teardrops on My Guitar, No Man Named Drew Has Ever Looked at Me and Lived to Tell the Tale, but at their best, the songs feel like lived experiences or stories told to you by a close friend. Now, is the whole album a home run? Absolutely not. The singles range from solid to very good, but there are only two deep cuts that I would recommend. And while the album does start us on the road to all too well, overall, the road still needs polish. But also, that's fine. I don't think it's realistic to expect artists to arrive fully formed on their debut. In fact, the amount of incredible debuts I've covered on this series is pretty small. I, I don't even think some of these are actually albums. Taylor Swift's debut record only sold about 40,000 copies in its first week. However, it was what Taylor and Big Machine Records did in the months after that made it a success. You see, Taylor was facing an uphill battle. Not only was she a girl in country music, not only was she a teenage girl in country music, but she was a teenage girl in country music singing songs about being a teenage girl. So when traditional outlets like radio more or less rejected her singles, she and BMR took to MySpace to promote her music. And by Jove, it worked. Not just the music, but Taylor Taylor writing blog posts and interacting with fans, giving them a unique connection to the person writing this music. So by doing that, the album and the singles became slow burns of success. In fact, Our Song and Should Have Said No hit number one on the Billboard country charts, making Swift the first woman to top that chart with a song she wrote entirely by herself. We call this move Pulling a Kate Bush. Taylor also toured throughout 2006 and 2007, mostly opening for other country acts. In fact, she was able to secure the opening gig for Rascal Flatts because the original opener, Eric Church, got booted for playing too long. While on tour, she started writing songs for her second album. Though in between records, we also got a Christmas album with a lovely cover of Last Christmas and a Walmart exclusive EP that is not available in any official capacity. After hopping in the studio with Nathan Chapman and other personnel, we got fearless in November 2008. Good snare, good snare. 
10 out of 10. This one is like Succession Season 2, or Ori and the Will of the Wisps. It takes everything its predecessor did and does it better. The hooks are more immediate, not just for their catchiness, but for their low barrier of entry, if that makes sense. This might come off as a bit of a backhanded compliment, but Taylor Swift is many things, and one of them is not a technically gifted singer, but she makes up for that with melodies that anybody can sing along to. That same accessibility extends to the subject matter. Now, granted, these songs are from the perspective of a teenage girl, which I am not, <gasps> but the emotions are universal. Unrequited love on You Belong With Me, a serendipitous romance on the title track, forbidden love on Love Story. In fact, Love Story showcases one of my favorite songwriting techniques from Taylor. When it comes time for the final chorus, she'll rephrase some of the lyrics to make for a more fitting ending while throwing in a key change. She does it like once an album, and it's great every time. With all that said though, the album can feel like it's reaching for heights that it can't quite get to yet. Personally, I don't buy 15. It's a perfectly decent song about the naivety of youth, but the person singing it was just four years removed from that age. Taylor, get back to me once you get kicked off your parents' insurance. And once again, while the singles more or less slap, there are only two or three deep cuts that I would come back for, plus another two if you count the deluxe version. But still, in my eyes, Fearless shows Taylor Swift on an upward trajectory. was a ridiculous success, not only enriching her existing relationship with fans, but bringing new diehards into the mix. Many of the singles went on to be the biggest hits of 2009, and the music videos became memeable to high heaven. One of those videos even got Taylor an MTV VMA award. What a great moment for her. And then this happened. Yo, Taylor, I, I'm really happy for you. I'm gonna let you finish. But Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. I can't believe I'm about to say this, but this event will shape the careers of both of these artists for the next decade. For Kanye, this was the start of a public turn of opinion that would lead him to seclude in a Hawaiian studio as he made one of my favorite albums ever. For Taylor though, this was seen as her major breakthrough to anyone not already immersed in the country scene, something that Kanye would later take credit for. Though, if I may push back on that a little bit, she had already scored huge hits and won awards. It's not like she was a complete nobody before this. Sure, it may have gotten her in front of more people, but it's like when you have an upset stomach and then you eat Taco Bell. It didn't change where things were going, it just expedited it. But anyway, VMA Gate led Taylor to experience a new kind of public scrutiny. For one, her relationships with actors and other musicians became huge stories. It's actually kind of surreal to look back on these stories and see how much of the coverage was fueled by... And also... That scrutiny also impacted her performances. A duet she did with Stevie Nicks at the 2010 Grammys was viewed as lackluster, to say the least. Needless to say, Taylor Swift had something to prove, and she proved all of her critics wrong by starring in Valentine's Day. Yeah, in between albums, Taylor got into acting, which she'll continue to do every so often from here on out. Personally, I think Taylor Swift would make a great actress, and I can't wait to see what she does from here. But almost two years after Fearless, Taylor released Speak Now in October 2010. The big change here compared to Fearless is in the list of songwriters, or rather, songwriter. Taylor Swift wrote every song on here by herself, perhaps as a way of saying to critics, murder's not legal yet, so until then, here's a song. Speaking of murder, God help the critic who inspired Mean. It's a delightfully petty song. I love how Taylor performs this bit. The other singles, Mine, Sparks Fly, The Story of Us, Back to December, are all fine as well, especially those last two. I, I love the chorus on Back to December. But I think, for the first time, this record shines most in its deep cuts. For example, Dear John is, as of this video, the longest Taylor Swift song. It's the first time I would ever use the word sprawl to describe a song of hers, and it really takes advantage of the added time to build dynamically. I also think this record is a good time to emphasize another one of Taylor's songwriting strengths, Bridges. One could argue that all Taylor Swift's songs are sick, twisted pranks to get you to listen to some excellent bridges. Enchanted might take the cake for best bridge on this album. That said, not everything on Speak Now speaks well. Better Than Revenge is basically Taylor doing Paramore's misery business. I, I don't think this has aged well in the slightest. Also, Innocent is supposedly a response to Kanye following the VMA incident. Some parts read as forgiveness, some read as patronizing. But more often than not, Speak Now proves Taylor's skill as a songwriter. I don't know if it's it's necessarily a better album than Fearless, but I think I might respect it more. 
Taylor Swift and Nathan Chapman kept writing songs as she toured for Speak Now, but after a certain point, Swift realized that the songs felt like a rehash of the past album. Speak Now had weight behind it. Speak Again doesn't really have the same ring. So instead, she shifted her focus to bringing in outside collaborators and embracing new genres like pop. Along with Chapman, she worked with producers like Max Martin, Shellback, Dan Wilson of Semisonic, Jeff Basker, who had just worked with Fun, Jackknife Lee, who did... Oh no. That collaborative spirit also extended to other songs she released after Speak Now. She put out a song for the Hunger Games soundtrack featuring the Civil Wars. It's a good song, but I'm now sad because I'm reminded that the Civil Wars broke up, their debut album was so good, moving on. She was also pulled into B.O.B.'s sphere of influence, if you will, with the song Both of Us. And we also got Taylor's first live album from the Speak Now tour. By the end of sessions for the next album, 30 songs were recorded and 16 were selected to form Red released in October 2012. Despite its pop aspirations, I would say Red is still a country album. One cannot simply just remove the twang from within, but I think it's a solid middle ground between country and pop, and it yields some of Taylor's best work so far. Some songs feature a newfound production sheen, like 22, Red, Starlight, and We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together. And you would hide away and find your peace of mind with some indie record that's much cooler than mine. Oh, come on, Taylor. Some of those indie records are pretty good. Check out High Violet by The National, I, I think you'd like them. And hey, um, I knew you were trouble. Has this aged well? Revisiting it, I think the chorus and verse hooks are better than I remembered, but there's also the dubstep drop. I can't think of many ways to make this feel more natural. Well, actually. But really, this whole album pales in the face of its emotional centerpiece all too well. This might be the best song in Taylor's entire discography. It was supposedly inspired by Jake Gyllenhaal, so thank you for that, Mr. Music. And it chronicles someone looking back on memories of a relationship with one of the best dynamic builds I've heard in a pop song. Also, shout out to the guy doing backing vocals, especially on this part. Damn good stuff. If there's anything I would knock Red for, it's the runtime. Red is over an hour long and it really doesn't need to be. Cut out some of the songs in the second half and I'd be hailing this as an outright classic. You may say, Mike, the past few albums were also pretty long, to which I'd say, yes. A long runtime is the one main criticism I have with almost every Taylor Swift album. But even with a few filler tracks, Red is, in my opinion, the definitive Taylor Swift album. If you want an album that highlights what makes Taylor Swift great, regardless of genre, this is it. Red was not only a commercial success and a critical high point for Taylor, but it also inspired about whether or not she was even a country star anymore. Sure, she might have guitars in her songs, but do country artists get goat remixes? Do they get memes made from them dancing to Kendrick Lamar and Imagine Dragons at the Grammys? Please don't answer that. And a lot of people didn't have answers for that, but Taylor sure did. As she began writing songs while touring Red, she decided her next record would be a full-on pop Album. She brought back Max Martin, Shellback, and Nathan Chapman. New producers this time included Ryan Tedder of One Republic and a newcomer named Jack Antonoff from Fun. In October 2014, 1989 was released. Lead single Shake It Off was a bitter pill for me at first, but I think I've come around on it thanks to that chorus. Though to this day, the bridge still throws me off, largely because of how it just sort of ends. Shake. And then it's like, haha, that was weird back to the actual song. Speaking of singles, 1989 might have the single best run of them in Taylor's discography so far. Blank Space takes the tongue-in-cheek tone from never ever getting back together and cranks it up to full-on satire as Taylor plays into all that dating noise. Music video is pretty funny too. Style is just kind of perfect. The hook, the story, the descriptions of both people in the relationship, probably the best song on the album. Wildest Dreams is a nice ballad, but good lord, the bridge on this is one of Taylor's best ever. There's a reason why it became a TikTok trend. I'm a sucker for pedal tones, and Out of the Woods has them in abundance. Just listen to those harmonies in the last chorus. My favorite deep cut on here is probably the Closer Clean. It's a nice, understated palette cleanser, offering a thematic resolution to the whole record. Also, remember how I said almost every Taylor Swift album suffers from a long runtime? 1989 is the one exception. There's only one song I would cut and everything else fits pretty well. 1989 is lean, catchy as hell, and can hit emotionally like a ton of bricks. Now is it better than to pimp a butterfly? No, 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 no. I'm not doing this today. I'm not doing this today. Remember your deep breathing. 
The tour for 1989 was effectively Taylor's coronation as pop royalty, not just represented by the scale of the whole show, but also the guests who would appear. Do you remember this? It was basically a meme how many random people would just show up to play their song or sometimes just pop up, wave, and then leave. And now, on a serious note, please welcome to the stage the ashes of the victims of the Salem Witch Trial! If you want to watch the tour, there was a recording that was on Apple Music for a bit, now it's available on YouTube. That tour was also used to promote the deluxe track, New Romantics, which I do enjoy. Speaking of new tracks, the Bad Blood remix? Not bad, actually. It comes off as a bit disjointed since Taylor's verses are completely omitted in favor of fellow country star Kendrick Lamar. Are these his best verses? No way, but he's still solid. Then again, Kendrick had just dropped my favorite album of the 2010s. He could have wrapped the Veggie Tales theme on this song and I would have loved it. Also, apparently the song is a diss track towards Katy Perry. Great, whatever. But it wasn't just Katy Perry with whom Taylor was feuding. Remember that guy from the VMAs? He put out a new album in 2016, and one of the songs had this line. I feel like me and Taylor might still have sex. Why? I made that bitch famous. God damn. God damn indeed. Kanye said they had gotten permission from Taylor to use the line, which her team flat out denied. Plus, Taylor kind of threw shade when 1989 won Album of the Year at the Grammys. There are going to be people along the way who will try to undercut your success or take credit for your accomplishments or your fame. Jump ahead a few months, and not only did Kanye put out a video for that song, featuring naked wax versions of Taylor and other famous people in bed, but Kim Kardashian said there was a video of Taylor giving permission for that one line, which Taylor's team again denied. And then this happened. Um, yeah, I mean, don't put up a line, you think it's better. It's obviously very tongue-in-cheek. So yeah, Taylor was caught in 4K, or from the looks of it, 480p, granting Kanye permission to use that line. Taylor did come out saying she hadn't heard the full song in context, but enough damage had been done. Now here's a fun fact about everything I just described. I don't care. I'm sure this matter was a big concern for the stakeholders involved, but all three of these people are multi-millionaires whose overall careers would be fine after this. And honestly, there were just more important things going on in the world around this time. Taylor Swift is out here going media silent and tweeting with Nick emojis. Meanwhile, white supremacists were heralding her as their princess. Now, is that Taylor Swift's fault? Not at all. And I can understand that she was put in a bit of a corner given the whole Kanye thing, might not want to risk another PR disaster. But like, surely that warrants a statement over dedicating yourself to some personal beef? I don't like phone calls in the slightest, but I'd gladly take a phone call if it meant dismantling white supremacy. But alas, the narrative had turned against Taylor and she retaliated with reputation in November 2017. Some of you might remember that this album and I go way back. The first video I ever made was about this album and how I didn't really care for it. And here I am over three years later and I still don't really care for it. Here's my thing. The songs on Red in 1989, they could sometimes feel like they were about being Taylor Swift, TMCR, but that feeling was balanced by relatable emotions or exquisitely curated stories. Reputation songs at their worst are just about being Taylor Swift. TMCR. Not to mention, for an album that presents itself as edgy and dangerous, it sure can sound safe. With 1989, Taylor and co made it a point to not go for a contemporary sound so as not to eventually feel dated. With Reputation, they apparently changed their mind, and so many of the songs incorporate a more modern production that, surprise, sounds a bit dated. My favorite thing to point out about this album is that over half of it is in the same key. Now, if I may play Taylor's advocate for a moment, oftentimes keys are chosen based on the artist's comfort singing or performing them. Some voices hang in certain keys better than others, there's nothing wrong with that. But A, the tracklist puts many of the C major songs right next to each other, which drags the pacing down, and B, this is supposed to be an edgy album. But oftentimes, the attempted edginess turns into just sheer pettiness. Songs like Ready For It, I Did Something Bad, This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Things feel so buried in their own headcanon that they forget to convey actual emotions. Gorgeous feels so clunky to me, like none of its pieces actually fit together. There's something so so careless about the way Taylor sings those backing vocals on the chorus. Also, I do like Endgame on a musical level, but it is still very funny to me that it features both Ed Sheeran and Future, and that Future's verse ends with him going, You owe me down and I protect you with my life. 
Like, Jesus, dude, I, I admire the dedication, but it's a lot. And oh God, how could I forget the lead single, Look What You Made Me Do. I'll say it now, this is the worst single Taylor Swift's ever released and the worst song on the album. It's the musical equivalent of a Notes app screenshot posted onto Twitter, except even that wouldn't have a right said Fred sample. But hey, I'd be lying if I said this album had no good songs, and most of my favorites are the ones where Taylor drops the snake persona and just writes songs like a human person. I'm talking Delicate, Getaway Car, King of My Heart, Dancing With Our Hands Tied, and Call It What You Want. And again, Taylor nails the closer with New Year's Day, which drops all the pretensions to give us a really sweet ballad. Reputation is a conflicting album. I don't like a lot of it, and I waffle between this and the debut as Taylor's least good album. That said, this record's always gonna hold a certain place in my heart. It's what inspired me to start this channel. So, um, thank you, Reputation, I guess? <laughs> Despite the efforts of this one random YouTuber, Reputation was pretty successful. Critical reception was okay, all things considered, but by this point, a Taylor Swift record was guaranteed to sell well. Taylor went on tour for the album, a tour that got rave reviews and is currently available to stream on Netflix if you're interested. It was during that tour where Taylor began feeling a wave of positivity from fans, a wave that she decided to channel for future work. Also, I should mention, during the lead up to this next album, she did condemn that whole neo-Nazi thing, so late to the party, but glad you made it. Speaking of the next album, it would be the first not under the Big Machine label. She instead moved over to Republic Records. And this is a perfect time to shout out today's sponsor, Private Equity. Private equity firms are such a great way for companies to raise money and grow their business. For example, I gotta give props to Ithaca Holdings, owned by artist manager Scooter Braun. In late July 2019, they acquired Big Machine along with the Masters to Taylor's first six albums. And sure, Taylor may have denounced the purchase, saying she wasn't given the chance to own her masters and that Scooter was a manipulative bully, but hey Taylor, maybe don't buy that new iPhone next time, huh? Again, massive shout out to private equity firms. Please give me back my children. Yeah, right before her seventh album came out, we learned that the master recordings to the past six albums were in the hands of Big Currency, and Taylor was mad about it. So mad that she stated she was going to re-record all of her past albums. This is going to matter much more in the coming years, but I needed to mention it, as it risked overshadowing Lover, released in August 2019. Let's start with the first song we were given off this record, Me. You. Yes, me. I still don't know what to make of this song. The chorus hook is excellent, but there's something about the production that gives me vanilla wafer energy. Like, I get the idea of playing things safe after a somewhat divisive album, but me thinks that me is a bit too safe. Well, except for... Hey, I will give myself an aneurysm if I start thinking about this for too long. There was also You Need to Calm Down, a single that combines Taylor's disdain for haters with the LGBTQ community's disdain for haters. Certainly a nice gesture, but I've never been a fan of the production. At least the music video gave us the fast food themed hatchet burying between Taylor and Katy Perry we were all begging for. The other two singles, Lover and The Man, are fine, the former being Taylor's attempt to secure her place in future wedding playlists. I think it's a case of single selection, because had we gotten different teasers for this album, it would be viewed in a much better light. What I'm trying to say is, the fact that Cruel Summer wasn't the first single is a crime against humanity. And can I be honest? Yeah, of course, go for it. Many of the best songs here are the understated ones. Take songs like I Forgot That You Existed, The Archer, False God, It's Nice To Have A Friend, Soon You'll Get Better With The Chicks. They get a lot of traction from having a more minimal production. So is Lover good? Yeah, I'd say so. It can feel uneven in spots, especially in the middle, but there's enough here to warrant a listen. Plus, I think Lover often gets overshadowed by the next record when it comes to Taylor's critical trajectory, but in its more subdued moments, Lover pioneered a lot of what that next record would do. So what is that next record? The dispute over Taylor's masters reared its head after Lover's release. Her older recordings were blocked from being played at the 2019 AMAs and from being used in an upcoming Netflix documentary. She even brought it up when she won Billboard's Woman of the Decade Award, based comrade Taylor Swift decrying private equity. But this particular valley in Taylor's career wasn't all silicon. She kept herself busy with acting, and in December 2019, she started- Ah, oh, no! No! Get out of here! This movie made Andrew Lloyd Webber a dog person. Anyway, after that abomination, Taylor signed a new record deal with Universal and started gearing up for her next tour, slated to start in April 2020. Oh no. Yeah, so that didn't happen. But to soften the blow, we did get Taylor's second live album that same month, which Taylor publicly denounced as an unapproved cash grab, and which only sold 33 units in its first week. All was quiet on the Taylor Swift front after that, until July 2020, 
with this image. It took me a good 20 to 30 minutes to process what this image was. Okay, so it's a photo of Taylor in a forest. Uh, let's see the caption. I was excited and honored when Taylor approached me and... Wait, Taylor didn't post this? Who did? Aaron Desner? Guitarist for the National? What is he doing working with Taylor Swift? And Jack Antonoff too? The world doesn't make sense to me anymore. Turns out, Taylor Swift made a whole record in quarantine with Aaron Desner and Jack Antonoff. Folklore, released very soon after that announcement in July 2020. Now let me lay out my biases real quick. I love The National. They're my dads and my best friends. I'm a huge fan of their sound, and when I heard Taylor Swift would be singing over songs that could easily fit on Sleep Well Beast, I was already sold on this. Lucky for me, Folklore also happens to be a very good album. In fact, let me get the sound of this record out of the way. This thing is gorgeous, but, but not like that. The instrumentation sounds great, with no elements in the mix overpowering each other, and the sense of space here is excellent, like on August, Exile, This Is Me Trying. Ironically enough, it's the first Taylor record in a while to feel like everyone was in the room. Now I should make clear, what Desner and Antonoff do for the sound of Folklore is great, especially when I listen to Cardigan, Seven, or Mad Woman, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's the light year's piano. But Taylor's lyricism on here is excellent as well, in large part because she really gets into telling third-person stories. The Last Great American Dynasty is about a divorcee who married into the Standard Oil family and the whispers of neighbors that would haunt her. Okay, so maybe they're not completely third person. Epiphany is written as a dedication to those impacted by or working through the pandemic. Even when she does bring personal drama into the mix, like My Tears Ricochet being about the Big Machine Masters controversy, it doesn't feel overbearing. And remember how I said Taylor's really good at using key changes? Betty might be my favorite key change in any Taylor Swift song. Shout out to that harmonica too. Again, I'll admit, I was already primed to like folklore. Even if it just ended up being Taylor reading drill tweets over Aaron Desner's production. The fact that the compositions are beautiful and the lyricism is engaging is a nice little bonus. Folklore was nothing short of an event, with it being heralded as the definitive quarantine album. It stayed within the public consciousness throughout the rest of 2020, which made it all the more surprising when Taylor announced a direct sequel and surprise dropped it. Evermore in December 2020. Now, a sister album, as Taylor put it, being released so soon after Folklore might lead some to think this is just a B-Sides record. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I was some. The first five or so tracks just didn't hit me much at first. Willow is the big single, and while it's pleasant, it's nowhere near Cardigan. Though I have come around a bit on Gold Rush, I, I really like the chorus on it. But the turning point for me was Nobody No Crime, which is not only the closest thing to a country song Taylor's made in years, but it's also the closest thing to a murder ballad that Taylor's made ever. Really great track. And from there, the record takes a fascinating turn, where folklore felt like a solid meeting point between pop and down-tempo alt-rock. Evermore is folk music. It's spacious and enveloping, and there aren't really many hooks or earworms to be found. I think I know why that might be. In terms of production, folklore was an even mix between Desner and Antonoff, but Evermore is, aside from one track, all Desner's production. As a result, you take Taylor's voice off these songs, and you could easily throw on Matt Berninger's husky baritone. And they even do on one song, Coney Island. Taylor Swift and The National together on one song. If you showed this to Mike 10 years ago, he would have had a great time. So I find myself at an interesting place revisiting this record. Between these two, I think Folklore is the more accessible record, and the one I would recommend first to a newcomer, but if you asked me which was the better one? Mmm, I might say Evermore. I honestly might. It's like going from Red to 1989. The first album showed she could play in the space, the second showed she could own it. While Folklore and Evermore created a lot of good buzz, not every bit of breaking Taylor Swift news was good. Right before Evermore dropped, we learned that her masters were transferred from Ithaca Holdings to Shamrock Holdings, another firm that happened to be owned by Disney. All roads lead back to the mouse. But remember how Taylor said she was planning on re-recording her first five albums? Turns out she was actually serious. And in April 2021, we got Fearless, Taylor's version. Good snare, good snare. 10 out of 10. I think it's important right up front to lay out what this album is and what it isn't. Fearless, Taylor's version, is a re-recording of Fearless as a way of creating new masters to Taylor's songs. So it would make sense that this album sounds like the original Fearless. In fact, this album sounds a lot like the original Fearless. I gotta commend the engineers on this because some of these new recordings are nearly indistinguishable from their originals. You might catch a small difference now and then, the snare on the title track, the way Taylor enunciates on Love Story, the guitar 
solo on You Belong With Me, but overall it is a near identical recreation of Fearless, and some songs have aged better than expected. For instance, 15 has more emotional heft to it here, purely because the person singing it can now rent a car without getting hit with extra fees. What Fearless Taylor's version isn't is a new take on Fearless. The team behind this did a darn good job at recreating Fearless, but they don't do anything unique. And while I'm kind of bummed by the conservative approach, I also know it's not entirely fair to judge this album for that, since it's explicitly trying to not do something new. Well, actually, I should correct myself. There are some new things on here. Included in Fearless plus new funky mode are the original album tracks, the deluxe tracks, and a bunch of previously unreleased songs recorded by Taylor and the Folklore Crew. And these are a nice bonus, especially if you're a longtime fan. My favorite being Mr. Perfectly Fine. So yeah, if you liked Fearless, you'll like Fearless. Taylor's been on a few songs since Fearless featuring Dante from the Devil May Cry series. Most recently was her hopping on two songs with Aaron Dessner's side project band, Big Red Machine. She also dropped the new version of Wildest Dreams as it was getting popular on TikTok. Her next big release is the re-recording of Red, slated to drop this November. It'll feature all 30 of the songs written for the album, plus a 10 minute long version of All Too Well. Jake Gyllenhaal, you've got a month's head start, run while you still can. And I'm pretty pumped to hear it, especially after going back through Taylor's discography. If you wanna get into Taylor Swift, I would recommend starting out with Speak Now, Red, 1989, and Folklore. And if you have a favorite Taylor Swift song, album, related thing, I would love to know what it is in the comments. As long as it's not cats. Cavity, my cavity.